Oh, we're live, live, yeah. audio and video. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to talk about the sky. We're going to talk pretty much about the whole sky, uh, all the way from terrestrial uh, experiences to cosmic experiences through big telescopes. With me today are uh, Kate Brakey and Brett Starr, who are the photographers for this exhibition at Art Intersection. The exhibition will be on through Saturday, June 19th. Make sure you get a chance to visit. If you are calling in from Australia or someplace <laughs> else, you can go to the website and see a virtual tour of the gallery and see the work kind of like you would on Google Street Maps. I would like to start by introducing Kate and Brett. Before I jump into that, I want to talk a little bit about how this exhibition came together uh, just from my perspective, Kate and Brett contacted me a little over a year ago with this really grand idea of this imagery that they had created and really wanted to have a space to exhibit that in. So for, for a year, we worked on how that would come together. They did a lot of work to create this exhibition of over 100 images. And what we're going to talk about and go through some of the images, and you see on your screen right now, Two of the walls, one wall that is this amazing presentation of many images of Kate's work, and then another wall that is an installation piece of cyanotypes by Brett. And the last thing that we really scheduled hard to do was how can we have an opening in the pandemic? So we have an opening on June 5th. We're going to have the doors wide open to come and visit. We're asking for masks still. We're all vaccinated. We hope you are too. And we will have just this wonderful opportunity for a social gathering and a fun evening, which we have now missed for well over a year. So to begin with, Kate Brakey is a Tucson-based photographer, and we've known her for many years and had her work in an exhibition here at Art Intersection in the past. Uh, very beautiful work, very talented um, image maker, and a very interesting person who comes to us from the other side of the world. And we'll also speak a little bit about that today. Brett Starr uh, came to us uh, four or five years ago for yeah. an exhibition of Light Sensitive, which is work that came out of the uh, dark room. And uh, he's here with his imagery. The two of them cooperated on the imagery, and then they have their own individual and unique images. So I'd like to start with Kate. Kate can you tell us just a little bit about yourself and what brings you to this space of uh, astronomy and the sky? Um, well, again, I've been an artist for a very long time, you know, over 40 years now. Um, and um, I'm based in Tucson, but I was born and bred in Australia. Um, I have, however, spent 30 years in the U.S. and, um, uh, I don't know, uh, made all sorts of work uh, Mostly, I'd say generally about the natural world. All my work is about the beauty and the wonder of the natural world, um, often, um, often animals and plants, um, but landscapes, skies, seas. Always had an interest in astronomy. And um, um, I, I'll, I'll stop there because I'll talk about the astronomy part in a minute. I won't go to, on too long. So one of the things about Kate's natural world photographs is that she lives in this beautiful place in the desert outside of Tucson, and she only has to walk out to her, her front porch to see a lot of the world, including some of the, the um, images that will be shown in this exhibition. Brett, tell us about yourself. Uh, so I'm a photographic artist also in Tucson. I have been kind of obsessed with the sky for pretty much my entire life. Uh, about 20 years ago, I got my first telescope that I still use today made actually quite a few or a few of the images in this show um, a lot of my work is also about the world around us the environment our interaction with the environment and then about photography itself and how the photograph is its own object and has its own kind of existence and we live with that um, like an environment so it's very interesting you'll see this work and the the object aspect of the work is amazing when you see the cyanotypes that are behind me to my left and some of the orotone images which we'll go through, you'll see how photographic artists can take an image and transform it into this object of beauty uh, and, and informative at the same time. So what we'd like to do is talk a little bit about 
uh, how you connected, uh, what was the uh, catalyst if there was one that drove the connection to to work on astronomy and the cosmos and the sky? <laughs> um, well, I guess we just discovered that we both had an interest in, in astronomy and that we'd both made lots of images of the sky. Um, obviously, me for a whole lot longer. <laughs> but we sort of suddenly went, you know, oh, we should like put these together and show together. And as Brett said, he had a telescope. Um, I've got a, I don't have a telescope, but I, I lived with someone for a long time who did and um, got to do a lot of looking through big telescopes. And I've actually got a 400 millimeter lens, which is fine by me that I put my camera on. And um, we really, um, I mean, as you just said, I, I keep that next to my front door so I can just walk out. And because I live outside of the, the city, uh, looking at the western Tucson mountains, I can photograph my my moons and so forth, like literally from my front porch. So we got together when we decided we were going to do something together, skies, mm -hmm. and we ended up getting very excited because the Neowise comet was coming mm -hmm. last July, yep. and you know got prepared for that and pretended we were you know Star we, we knew what we were doing, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, and started photographing the comet. And to our kind of amazement, we got some pretty good pictures. And then when the last big event was the conjunction between Saturn and Jupiter, again straight in front of my house, you know, against the mountain, there was this thing happened and we got together and yeah. and he used his actually he used a hustle blood. So the, the picture that I have of the show in it, yeah, I used my yeah, hustle blood. I mean, I'm all about, you know, I've spent my entire life doing um, wet dark room. Um, and now I'm perfectly happy doing digital and he's like, <laughs> oh no, I've got film to process. And yeah. It's a yeah. complete reversal. Of <laughs> I remember going to Casper, Wyoming to catch the big eclipse that happened mm. and how beautiful that was. And I had my camera set up and all that stuff. And I got back and I was going to post some images on Facebook just uh, to show what I had seen. And then I saw your images posted on Facebook. Um, and I said, there's no way I'm posting my images on Facebook because those are beautiful. I didn't know what I was doing. Actually, I, I was nervous as all hell and I had to practice for a long time in the backyard and make a filter. And I went into a complete like freak out when it was happening. And I mean, I'll talk about that later, but um, I, I honestly, did, I missed the whole thing because I was so anxious and I was behind my camera br bracketing like crazy up and down for you know the two minutes of total yeah. and um and kind of missed the whole thing all everyone went dancing and singing and having a <laughs> fine old time in the twilight and it's like oh I missed it it was, was quite a party where yeah. we were too with yeah. it when it was in that twilight setting but uh, uh I finally gave up with my camera so thank you for posting those because <laughs> right. they're magnificent um yeah, continue on with a collaborative conversation here before okay we um uh, get into some of the images here's a beautiful image though is that from uh, the yeah backyard? that's um i guess you know living in the southwest as i said i have views um of the south the east which are the catalinas and the west which are the tucson mountains and so every time you go outside you know at certain times of day you can't help but see the moon and the sun rise and set and yeah. i've gotten quite used to sort of knowing when that's going to happen so I can actually go out, as I said, with my great big long lens and turns you into a bit of a sun watcher. You know, you see the sun and the moon setting on a different place on the horizon and think tomorrow's going to be perfect time and perfect setting on the mountain. Yeah, I'm always, and, whenever I'm at our house, you know, she'll say, oh, the moon's going to rise right over here. So we're going to dash up the street and <laughs> load everything quickly, into the car yeah. and, yeah, run up to the street yeah. And, yeah. and go see where the moon is. And so, sometimes we're right, sometimes we're wrong. Anyway, obviously the full moon is a beautiful thing, but every aspect of the phases when it sets, you know, over that horizon, different places at different times and um, back backlights different things and it's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, you, you want to talk about your landscapes next? Yeah, um, so these are some of my landscapes. So I, I am interested in keeping a little bit of the horizon in the photograph um, for the most part because I like this idea that no matter where you're at, you know, in the middle of nowhere, you can still have some kind of trace of being grounded. There's still some reminder that you're you're somewhere. You're not up in the sky. So here we have um, planes that always remind us that, yeah, you know, we have these things in the sky. There's light pollution from city lights that no matter where you're at, you're always going to have some kind of reminder um, of our existence. And if there isn't a reminder, then you become that reminder. So I like this idea that, you know, it grounds us, it, it keeps us at home, um, but also, you know, forces us to look up and see what's out there and imagine what could be out there. Uh, one of the things that we agreed we wouldn't do is per se talk about 
the camera equipment that we use to capture this, but I just have to ask, that square, was that a hustle block? It was, okay. yes. I, I just, I, 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 he's, <laughs> he's nuts, yeah. I like process, I like the whole aspect of photography. So for me, it's the whole experience. So using that camera forces me to slow down. You know, I can't immediately go look at it. You know, I like the sound, I like the motion, I like focusing, I like every yeah. aspect of. Not knowing what you know, you're gonna get. Yeah, not knowing what you're gonna get, just using the machine as, as itself and being so, one with it. One of the embarrassing moments as you go between a film camera and a digital camera <laughs> is when you're using the film camera and you lean the back up so you could see the image. Yeah. Do you do that? I, you know, not not very often, but occasionally. Every once in a while. It's hard with this one because it's such a different experience using it, which yeah. I think is the other reason that I like it because it's so removed from yeah. a digital photograph. And that kathunk just sounds yeah. so good. It's beautiful. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, we, we uh, photographed. Yeah, so the, that's uh, Neowise. Neowise yeah, together, and that was fun. Chasing um, out, you know, it's middle of monsoon season in Tucson. So, yeah. you know, oh, I think tonight's going to be clear. Let's go see if we can get a picture of Neowise. Yeah, and... it was great. And I've photographed some comets before, way back in 79. It was uh, Hale Bop, was mm -hmm. the very bright object in the sky. I think we've got that up next. Um, and I photographed that with film, but it was 35 millimeter film with like a slight slightly long lens and um, so my image that's on the wall here you can actually see the grain and you can you know it's like the real thing back in the day. <laughs> I, I took two 35 millimeter cameras out in the desert two o'clock in the morning 15 years ago and they were firing kind of independently mm -hmm. with a Leonid uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hail or yeah. hailstorm uh, yeah. meteorites and I got back, I don't know, I had five rolls of 36 exposure and I had captured probably three or four of yeah. these silly meteorites. Yeah, well, I've actually, I've, I've got now wise in the other room that has a, the only reason I printed it, because I've got hundreds of the pictures of the comet, but there's one that I noticed much later when I looked closely that had a shooting star in it. And I thought that oh, was wow. really lucky. So yeah. that oh, one's yeah. actually in the That's next special. room. Yeah, it is. That's it. That's yeah. my, um, that's Hailbop actually very bright, much brighter and fatter than yep. now wise. I think it came much closer actually. It might even be a bigger chunk could of be, ice. Could be. Anyway, that was very exciting, as I said, f f with film bracketing again like crazy. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so um, this is again one of the pictures that I took again straight out my front door with my 400 millimeter lens um, setting uh, on the horizon that I have, uh, which is a peak called Safford Peak at the end of the Tucson mountains and um, I watch it slide behind that peak and then often slides behind the very top of the peak which is beautiful and as I said you get uh, wonderful backlit swarrows on the edge. There's one of the swarrows that uh, was very fortunate that was a waxing crescent moon and I think it was a super moon I can't remember but it was golden like that and um, and again to see the detail of the swarrows up there yeah, on the on the peak is that pretty special. To the yeah. terrestrial yeah. perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I've heard this word many times, and I've never bothered to look it up. Waxing is that? Yeah, it's waxing and waning. It's either getting fuller or less full. Okay, it depends where it is in its its fullness or new moonish. Yeah, it's either and going wax, coming or going. Waxing is getting bigger. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I guess when people say I'm waning, that means that I'm getting yeah. older. Now. That's right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so that's one of my eclipse images uh, from 2012 when we had a partial solar eclipse here in Tucson um, when you could see it. So we went out, had special lens made for the camera, just like Kate was talking about, and, you know, just going out bracketing, shooting and, and having fun, you know, yeah. tracking these different astronomical events, kind of using that as a calendar of my life of like what interesting space things have I gotten to see um, over my lifetime. Where did you do that? That was here, actually. Out, oh, okay. uh, I, I okay. think I was out by Gates Pass when I saw so that. That was partial here, obviously. Partial, yep. Yeah, I went up to Nebraska. And well, the, yeah, this was the the 2012, oh, okay. I think, so an okay. older one. Yeah, okay. So, yes, I um, again, because we have this beautiful monsoon season um, and you get these extraordinary things go on where you have a, a rainbow at sunset and, you know, cloud, uh, a sky full of beautiful clouds. Um, I forgot to say in the very beginning that as a photographer, um, I've never been like a straight photographer. I always, coming from a painting, printmaking background, I, I like to alter my images. I can't help myself. So many of my images I've either hand colored or I've, in this case, I've gone back and I've added pastel and pencil just to lift up some of the tones. And you can, you will see that if you look closely enough at the actual work. Um, this one is big, it's 24 by, uh, I don't know what, 
70 or something. Um, it's actually, to be perfectly honest, it's two images married together. Because I was going to ask as a panorama, because, yeah. Yeah, it's, I just took two pictures and married them because I couldn't get the whole thing in. And again, this is out the, my backyard. I mean, this is when I was feeding our horses when we had horses. And it's like I looked up and there was this rainbow and it was just like, whoa. Yeah. Anyway, so. Oh, so here's another one of my landscapes. So again, kind of talking about this idea that we're being grounded. I'm using fire to light the trees. Um, the campfire that was sitting around us, I kind of saw the Milky Way in between us. This is up, uh, we have my family has property up in Sholo. Uh -huh. So this is up there, um, sitting around the campfire. I saw the Milky Way between the two trees and I was like, I have to make this picture. Yeah. And then it wasn't until uh, much later when I was processing the image that I noticed there was a little galaxy over in the corner there. And I was like, what a beautiful kind of just, oh, it all happened to happen. Yep. Yeah. All coincidence. That's, that color in the trees is just amazing. Yeah. Yep, I would never would have thought, you know, the fire would have given that much kind of influence to the photograph. But now, how many acres did you burn after that? <laughs> no acres. <laughs> no acres. No acres. Okay. Very fire safe up there. It's, uh, we've had too many fires up there. Yeah. So yeah. That's not trying stunning. to have that happen. Especially when you know that you've got a bit of this earth, wind, and fire thing mm -hmm. going on, that whole marriage of, yep. of elements. Yep. So this is um, the big installation that we're sitting next to that I did because uh, I'm insane also. <laughs> um, I, I have to say, uh, I've been very lucky in my life living in Australia, um, which and of course in, to, in Arizona, where there are these big open skies and often magnificent suns, sunsets and sort of lots of drama that you can't help but notice. Um, it's not foggy, it's not polluted, you know, you just get to see the sky and notice the sky. So I've always photographed, you know, odd clouds, sunset clouds. Um, and I decided at some point, you know, it would be kind of nice to put them all together. Um, and this is called 20, uh, 52, because I had to count them, 52 <laughs> little images uh, of big skies. It's a, it's a bit of a cliche, but, um, you know, skies always represent timelessness and uh, infinity and sort of, you know, em empty space, transience. Um, I've always loved other artists' work, uh, the very elemental cloud work by Gerhard Richter. Uh, if you go look at that, it's very beautiful. And of course, you know, all the people, um, uh, George O'Keefe did a lot of skies out in, yes. in New Mexico. Um, I like to say that, uh, and you know, James Terrell, who does light skies, if you live in the Southwest, you can't really ignore the sky. It's yeah very dominant and it kind of, you know, it sort of swallows you up and affects you. And, uh, you know, we've got a quote up here, a Cisneros quote, um, you know, you can never have too much sky. You become sort of addicted to the sky because it's so present. Um, and I find it fascinating. It's, it's almost like having this never ending sort of um, dr dramatical or, or theatre production. The, the backdrop always changes and there are these objects, the clouds, the moon, the, the the sun that perform against that backdrop, um, and it's never the same twice. You know, it's like it's it's uh, the clouds become these little ephemeral sculptural things. And often I've seen a beautiful cloud, a perfect cloud, and I've run in to get my camera, mm -hmm. and by the time I get out, um, it's gone. It's evaporated or it's been blown away. Is that my? Is that mine? Yeah, I thought Can't we turned be? it on. I thought we did too. That's terrible. Sorry. Thank you. Um, um, anyway, so that was the thing. I just decided I was just going to put all of these pictures together on a wall to kind of, um, you know, express the fact that it's, it's so diverse. What you see outside is so diverse yeah. and it's kind of beautiful and, and, and again, um, overwhelming, dramatically overwhelming half the time. It so. is. So, uh, people who are watching this video can't see Evan who's sitting behind with all the knobs and controls, etc. But he came out here from a uh, school in Rochester and New Jersey and said that one thing that s amazed him was, uh, I'm not looking at trees all around me and I just love trees, but that now I get to see everything because it's all out there in the open mm -hmm. and uh, visible to me. So I get a sense of large space and not just this, not claustrophobic, but tighter space. And mm -hmm. so that's what the Southwest really yeah. is. I grew up on the ocean and the coast of California and and then being here where you can see for 
you could always see an, an horizon and that's yeah it's kind of amazing you yeah. can always see this huge distance and it gives you a different feel <laughs> so while the exhibition is called the sky there's actually this uh terrestrial or earthbound perspective mm -hmm. as 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 this part of the sky as we've talked about today yeah. and and it shows up in many of these images uh, while we're still on this i want to say um this is actually one of the reasons Kate and I kind of started talking about this show. I saw one of the images up on this wall in her house, and I said, you know, I, I have an obsession with clouds as well. I think we should we should work on something together. So we kind of both were like, as insane artists, you know, let's let's come up with something wild and, and do something with clouds and sky. And Yeah. So we're talking about the telescope stuff now? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. You want to um, ask us a question or just launch into Oh, my... I've got plenty of questions here. <laughs> so... When we sat down in the beginning of this conversation for an exhibition, we did have the conversation about clouds and about astronomy and about sunrises, sunsets, eclipses. Uh, so it was, it was a very broad conversation. And then when the astronomy conversation came in, Brett and Kate actually employed a telescope. And my first question is kind of connected to the two of Two questions together. Where is this telescope? It's not in your backyard. <laughs> no. And how did you learn about this? What what was that connection that you made? Okay. Well, in fact, it started a long time ago when Rickson Reed, who is the owner and director of uh, Photo Eye Gallery and Photo Eye Books, who's an amateur astronomer, a serious amateur astronomer, he sent me uh, a picture of the Tarantula Nebula, and I was just stunned. I thought my god you've got incredible telescopes and i said did you take this picture and he just sent me the link to this company who is a remote hosting uh, telescope place called itelescope.net and it's a not-for-profit self-funding internet-based observatory that now has 20 telescopes at four locations around the world wow. uh, on three continents for public use so all you need is access to the internet and you can take your own deep sky pictures. They started with one telescope in New Mexico, I think about 20 years ago, and this has just grown and grown and grown. Um, the one we decided that um, we would use one of the, the location that's in Siding Springs Observatory in Australia, New South Wales, Australia, on top of a mountain. It's a serious observatory, but it mm -hmm. has, has this component, which is the eye telescope thing, which is these I don't know, seven or eight telescopes in a shed, a great big shed, all just, you know, hooked up. You can live stream the shed and like see where they're, yeah. what they're all you, doing. Oh, and is they're that all, right? They're all oh, moving cool. around. Yeah. So what, you know, what you do, um, oh, it's operated by the Australian National University. And of course, Australia, the nice thing has, it's got very dark skies, very mm -hmm. clean skies. And um, frankly, we look at a part of the, the sky that's, more interesting <laughs> if I, I might say, say you're looking and at a different hemisphere exactly, than we're used yeah. to up yeah. here yeah. so we decided so you you pick an object um you don't even have to know the coordinates they know all that stuff you pick the mm -hmm. object that you want to to photograph and you pick the you know, appropriate telescope which is a bit of a complication but we'll you'll talk about that, that. <laughs> and then you decide what filters you want to use and there's lots and lots of things actually and you book you book a slot and then off it goes and you get the files uh, delivered I mean, you get you get a notice to say the files are ready, yeah. and you go, "Wow, this is exciting!" But I've never seen what this anyway. You'll talk about that, but it was fun, and it's very exciting indeed to to know that you're taking pictures from a telescope in the other side of the world of something seventy million light years away. It's yeah. like, how cool is that? So, so, was the image a surprise when you received it? A lot of times. So yeah. they have when you book the telescope, they have. Um, one website that they help you is the planner mm -hmm. so it shows you pick on your wet observatory and it says okay well these are the things that are above the horizon right now at these times of, of night um so you pick your object it says do you want a, a nebula a galaxy um, globular cluster anything like that so you go through and then you know you go to a different website that says okay this is what you can see here's what the different eight telescopes can see so you can kind of frame it and say oh this one's going to be able to see it nice in the frame or um, and some of them are higher resolution and longer yeah. focal length than the whole thing well, like this image is currently up. Yeah. I mean, some of the images have a, you know a single object in the center. Some of them, like this, have everything around it. It's just stunning. Yeah. Yeah. That's the um, Eagle, Eagle Nebula. Nebula. Yeah. Did you have any failures? I mean, did you oh, get yeah. an image and you say, ah? 
Yeah, there's a couple of them. So the one telescope that we use for a lot of the galaxies, um, T17 at this observatory, actually has the world record for the furthest deep space object. So it's a highly scientific um, camera. It's not so much one used for, you know, photographic use. They use it for research. Mm -hmm. And we use it for our own images because we don't really care so much about resolution. It's about finding this beautiful object. So a couple of them, you know, if you if you schedule it and, and the roof shuts on you, they'll book it for the same time that's available okay. next. Okay, now and the roof shuts about this. a lot. Yeah, just arbitrarily, there's a windstorm coming no, up. Yeah, windstorm, yeah, it's a too humid, it's rainy, it's, it's too cloudy, full moon can mess it up, you know. So if it rebooks and says, oh, roof closed, uh, that same time slot's available in, in four days, we'll book it. Uh, well, four days from now, we're going to have a full moon. I can't have that. So a yeah. couple of times, you know, the full moon's in there and, and it's like, oh, that, that picture's not great. But it is always exciting seeing, you know. But as I said, I mean, uh, what happens is you get files that you don't even know, you know, what to do with them. So then you have to actually learn. Uh, and we process. did, we, we watched a couple of webinars. They're very good about like teaching yeah, you know, stupid yeah. people how to do this. <laughs> and, um, well, the first one that we did as like kind of a test, because they do, you can click a button and it says five minute image. So it'll program it as soon as it's available, five minutes and send it to you. So we're like, yeah, let's do one, you know, don't, and it came to my email. So we're like, don't open, I'm not going to open the email. Like we'll, we'll have a little party, come see it in the morning. Um, and so we looked at it first was like, oh, that's it. We didn't know kind of there's a whole lot of processes in it. Yeah, do. It's, it's many files that you have to marry and then you have to learn how to do that. And, you know, it's it's more complicated than we thought. It was like, oh, <laughs> we, what have we. But it does give you something. So at least, you know, very quickly we know, oh, this is a yeah. good one. This is going to be something exciting to process. So in the population of people using this equipment, are you the only artists that are involved in this? I mean, no idea. We have no idea. We have yeah. to assume. I would have to assume, I feel like, because the way they respond to us, they're like, oh, well, you're using a, you know, that telescope you shouldn't be doing that with. Like, you should do it with something else. It's like, but I don't, I want it for a different reason. Like, I'm more interested in the object and mm. getting to see the object. Because we actually didn't want them to look like, you know, Sky and Telescope magazine. Yeah pictures that were like all the color nebula and everything. We wanted something, you know, much grainier and, and more printmakingly. Yeah, and to reference the history really of care. photography a little yeah, bit. We of... didn't actually care if they were. So when you registered, you didn't have to say Dr. Brakey or Dr. Star, <laughs> right? Anyone can do this, yeah. trust me. But uh, as I said, I think, I think interestingly enough, a lot of artists who might want to do it, and I've had a few people say, I want to do that, you know, and it's like, well, good luck with that because it's taken us, you know, at least six months to actually yeah, figure to it out. It. I mean, he's the tech guy right uh, i don't yeah. know how to do this <laughs> stuff um i mean i don't know that some of the processing stuff is beyond my well level the first one we got we we're like what's a fit file how yeah. do we how do we process this? so we like, then went to google what it. a fit file was because we couldn't even we couldn't even open it so it was, it was an adventure it was, it a, was an it adventure. Was a journey it was a sharp yeah. learning curve yeah, yeah. Well, you, fabulous could you repeat the website itself? yes oh. it's itelescope.net Okay. Yeah. And there's another one actually. There's a uh, there's several slew. Slew. S L O E. -E. Oh. So, yeah. <laughs> How do you spell slew? S L O U G H? No, it's no. a different cuz it's what it's what the t it's the telescope. Oh, term the slewing. When it slews. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. What how is that what how do you spell that? Oh, I S L E W I N G. <laughs> slewing. <laughs> yeah, probably slew. Just well, to the yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yes. Anyway, it was cool. And as I said, we've got, you know, our furthest object is... Um, 60 million light years? 60 million light years. And wow. as everyone should know, that, si that means it takes 60 million years for that light to reach us. Yeah. And the whole idea that that telescope is actually um, collecting, you know, pixels of 60 million year old light. I mean, that object mm -hmm. may not even exist. It might have been swallowed by its own black hole for all we know. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. It's, it's just this, you know, it's mind boggling and it's this stuff is incomprehensible and we still get all sort of like, you know, teary eyed about it because <laughs> it's well, and it makes you feel so small too, knowing yeah. that object is, you know, 50 yeah. some million light years from us right now. And yeah, yeah. No other... one of the things and, and I will tell you that um, a person that came through the exhibit sent me an email and said how beautiful the exhibit is and how emotional she oh, got. Good. And she didn't tell me which images brought that out, but she had tears uh, wow. because wow. It, it touched something, yeah. right? So yeah, yeah, these images of the solar systems and galaxies could make you feel small. Mm -hmm. Some of the clouds could make you feel perhaps introspective, you know, yeah. and, mm -hmm. and a sunrise could make you feel elated. And I mean, there's all these emotions that we've attached to the sky. Yeah. 
And in this exhibit, you have absolutely touched on mm. all of those facets of what the sky means to us. Mm. Lots of poems written about the sky. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Lots of wine yeah. consumed yeah. watching the skies. Yeah. So that was our first one. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> that, 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 that last that last image spiral. was our first. We, that was our we first particularly image. like spiral galaxies. We just think they're kind of beautiful. Yeah. It's they like are. when you're stirring your coffee and you get a spiral galaxy, mm -hmm. it's like there's something beautiful about it. And um, hey. So uh, tell me about this next image here. Um, I've, I've observed the sun. Um, and these sunspots are very interesting. Are those sunspots or is that no, a, so this is one, that, this is Venus. So oh, okay. um, in uh, June 5th, I think 2012, uh, Venus transited across the sun and we could see it from North America. And this happens pretty rarely. Um, and so that, that little black dot is, is the planet next to us, just right in front of the sun. Yeah. Um, again, went out, out by Gates Pass and had my little uh, DSLR and my 400 300 millimeter zoom lens and you know a little filter that we made for it and i said let's go see this and i can't remember is that where the women come from or where the men come from women 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 okay so that's the planet mm -hmm. <laughs> excellent uh yeah so i've got a whole series of uh lunar eclipses i love eclipses solar and lunar and of course um a, a lunar eclipse occurs when uh when it it passes into the shadow of the earth. So it's when the sun and the earth and the moon are lined up. And for a, a full lunar eclipse, um, you get this strange transition where the shadow goes across it. And then you get what's called a blood moon, where you get this beautiful, diffuse, bright uh, red light. Actually, this isn't a complete um, blood moon, but some of them are just magnificent. They're just, and, and what happens is you get to see the moon um, it looks much more three-dimensional than we're ever used to looking at. We, you know, we see it as a disc in the sky, and then yeah. suddenly when it's lit by the, by the, I mean, it's it's lit by the sun always, but it's got a, a blurry shadow of the earth, and it starts to look like a beautiful Puts ball. A shape on yeah. it. Yeah, and you know, it's it's haunting and kind of spooky, and um, I don't know. So I I just love it. So every time there is a a lunar eclipse, and I've I've I mean, there's very often actually. Mm -hmm. um, you can look them all up and and. Uh, I've waited for them. Well, this is another case. I posted an image I made of the blood moon, <laughs> and then I saw your posting, and I wanted to go take mine down. Oh, so I'm going to unfriend on. you, so I don't have to <laughs> okay, look Okay, that's right. But this is beautiful. This is yeah. clearly, and it does create such a, an amazing shape to the moon. Yeah, and of course, they were full of any eclipses, but because lunar eclipses was more often than solar eclipses, you know, in every culture, uh, there's, there's the, the, it's a portent for something, or it's often very bad luck it's about wars coming or you know what i mean it's like all these big astronomical events that no one yeah. understood yeah uh, right. became very significant in the so culture. you mentioned this cultural connection to ellipses mm. and i wasn't going to say it but since you brought it up the old danny k movie a uh, yankee and king arthur's court i think it is yeah I remember he was that. about to be executed but he knew that an eclipse was coming that's right Come and on. he said if you don't let me go i'm gonna you know, block out the sun. Block out the sun, yes. yeah, and then the eclipse comes and they let him yeah. go. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, that was. <laughs> yeah. No, I kind of remember some that. childhood. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, there's a few of these, and yeah. there's I think there's three or four different ones, but mostly they're the ones from uh, 2018 and 19. But you know, they look quite different because they go through this couple of hour transition. Um, I remember once I was I was doing a workshop actually with Carol and Jim in Italy, and I was flying uh, to uh, Florence. And um, there was going to be an eclipse, and I, I actually decided I was going to photograph it out the airplane window, which of course is just this horrible scratched thing that's this thick. Yeah. And but I, I had my camera pressed against the window, you know, determined to get it. And all of the flight attendants were like, "What are you doing?" And and I'm saying, "There's an eclipse out. There's an eclipse." And it's like, "Oh, really?" You know. And then they, were, I let them all look through my long lens, not my big four, just my slightly long lens, um, at the eclipse and. Mm. And, you know, they were all taking it in turns. I think the plane was half empty, so I had most people coming and looking at the eclipse <laughs> oh, wow. through my yeah. lens in the airplane. How fun to share that I know. Yeah, with, was, with people. Yeah. But clearly, again, in this image, the light um, brings another perspective of the moon. Yeah. The shape of the moon gives it real character yeah. besides that just a solid disk, which yeah. is also beautiful. But yeah. This is gorgeous. Yeah, it's like too. a bead or a pearl or something, you know, yeah. it's so beautiful. And it's interesting to see it, the eclipse gives the moon such a different shape than just it waxing or waning. It it, it does it at a different angle and makes it look yeah. different. And it, it's interesting how that, that affects it. 
Yep, there's another one. I think that's an older one. I think that's 2008. Yeah. And so that brings me to the fact that I also, when I went off and photographed the, uh, the uh, solar eclipse, it was fairly specifically because I wanted to gild them, which is one of the things I do. I, I've been um, gilding images, um, call them orotones, um, and we'll talk a bit about that a bit later. But I wanted basically to put gold leaf behind a series of my solar eclipses and, um, and make them glow and gleam yeah. as they should because, you know, it's so fiery. And uh, this is called first contact as the, as the moon comes across. It's first contact, second contact, which is total, and then third contact as it's moving off. Mm. And um, so I, I stood there for however, it was two hours, I guess, and I'm, I made probably a thousand pictures of this event, as I said, kind of. And then there was the two minutes of total where everyone was dancing and singing and, and, uh, the, and the birds went to sleep and the animals start, you know, whatever, all the things that go on that are kind of cool. And uh, they were playing James Brown. I remember that. That's the only thing I remember. They had a, they had a whole soundtrack, actually. Huh. And they had as many as many songs as they could find about about Total Eclipse of the Heart, you know, the whole yeah. whatever. Oh. And it was, it was very, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. Um, so this uh, was something I did. I actually juxtaposed a blood moon um, total lunar eclipse with the total solar eclipse, and these are out in the lobby ha hallway, and they're um, they're both 24 inches square, so they're the biggest I've done, uh, biggest gilded things I've done, and I did it because, um, and I call this sun and moon a perfect match from uh, a beautiful coincidence, um, because the the whole thing was that they were both when I did the recent events, one was the eclipse of 217 and one was the lunar eclipse of, of 218. And, you know, I started thinking about how the sun and the moon significantly affect all life on Earth and that these two things were the most dramatic events we'll ever witness, basically. Yeah. And there's a coincidence about the relationship of the sun and the moon. And the, sun, the moon appears to be the same size as the sun, which is why we get the beautiful corona thing happening. Uh, and that's because the sun... The, the sun is 400 times wider than the moon, but it's 400 times further away. So from our perspective right here, right now on Earth, the moon um, exactly fits over the sun. It's the exact same size. And of course, this wasn't true in the history of the Earth because the moon is actually moving away from us at a uh, an inch a year. So it used to be closer and it's mm. moving away. So we never had this this is a perfect coincidence that right now while we actually can record it with digital, photography. <laughs> digital cameras <laughs> that it happens to be uh the same size and you get this thing happening that's spectacular that's so it's a beautiful coincidence is what the name of it is one of the things about the orotones um, is we shut the lights off and the ambient light in the room with all the lights off the orotones yeah. glow from that ambient that reflected light it's uh, yeah. It's a, quite a stunning presentation. Usually lighting the work is uh, tricky. This is even trickier because we shut the lights off. Yeah. But it is, it is such a, a treat to see these in a dimmed room. Yes. So if any of you have the chance to come into the gallery, we're more than happy to shut the lights off so that you can experience <laughs> this, this glow. Um, one of the interesting parts of the exhibit, beside the diversity, uh, the, the breadth of the expression of the sky, is the manner in which it's been presented. And getting away from a lot of what we see today, if we look at Instagram or Facebook, is that we're seeing digital projected images on our computer screens, and many exhibits will be, uh, you know, digital prints with all of the precise, sharpened images uh, that are so clean and so neat that sometimes that precision gets a little overwhelming. What is in this exhibition is this range from the cyanotype prints that are behind me, which are very soft and, and, and individually nondescript, to gum prints, to these orotones, to uh, the uh, paper prints. It's just an amazing way to present the work and, and the object of it. So you talked about orotones. You talked that you've been doing it for a while because I, I remember seeing this work for some time now. Mm -hmm. 
Is this work that you're going to probably continue to do? Is this still exciting to you? Um, yeah, I've slowed down a bit um, only because um, <laughs> there are 400 now in the series and about 200 out there variously, you know, yeah. consigned. And it's like, um, I need to actually <laughs> sell some. Get rid of some. Yeah. Yes. By the way, all of these prints are for sale. <laughs> this would help us to and continue I do more Kate's than, work. I mean, I do. I, I've gone back again because I was. I've been a photographer for so long, and and I did analog photography on a house of blood and on thirty five millimeter, etc. For so long that I've gone back and um, mined my archive of film uh, negatives and scanned them and then made those into orotones, which is that I have them printed on UV glass yes. and then I gild the back. And that's what, and, and again, this is my modern day version of, of something that uh, is, was called an orotone back in the turn of the century uh, when the likes of Edward Curtis and Pillsbury mm -hmm. were first doing it. I'm actually not sure who invented it. They did variations on the theme, but that was of course images printed on glass and then uh, this mixture that was called bronzing, uh, bronzing paste that was made up of all sorts of chemicals, nasty chemicals, mercury in fact, and mm -hmm. uh, walnut oil and so mm -hmm. forth was smeared on the back. Uh, I think there was a version too where they did gild it with gold leaf, um, which is what I do, 23 carat gold leaf. Mm -hmm. And um, if you know anything about gold leaf, it's, um, it's hammered out to being a micron thick, thin, thick or thin. And so it's quite hard to apply because um, it floats around. Yeah. <laughs> you can't breathe and you can't have the air conditioning on. And, uh, you know, I looked down at my, my cat once and it was like covered in because <laughs> it had floated around. But Edward Curtis did, certainly developed it for lots of his images of the mm -hmm. Southwest and all of his Native American work. Um, huge number of beautiful orotones. He really wanted his images just to have a richness and a depth that he mm -hmm. couldn't get otherwise. So that's why he started doing that. And I remember seeing them... Um, Etherton Gallery uh, has got them, and some of the museums, of course, have, and um, and they're just beautiful, you know. And I just thought, you know, I'm going to do that, but obviously, I'm going to do it the the simple the simple way, which is digitally so print on glass. We're in the presence of almost of work from three centuries, you yeah. know, of technology. Yeah. 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 Um, the uh, cyanotypes. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. We have some images. Just yeah. This this image also. Yeah, so. It's an orotone. It's another moon one. Yeah. Another moon on the mountain one. And while it's beautiful and bright light, it, it really deserves to be on a wall where there's some ambient light coming onto it. So the, yeah. the warmth and the glow of it can be present and you can enjoy it. Just get absorbed by it. Cyanotypes. Um, 1840s process. Uh, Henry Fox Talbot. Yeah. Uh, What's what's the draw into this work? And before I go too much further, and I think you'll touch on it, part of this, you, you really enjoy the the movement of the shadow on the back when you've got any kind of movement of the yep. work in front. Yeah. So, so tell us about this work. Uh, so yeah, I'm like I said earlier, I like process. I'm a process person. I'm interested in this idea that the photograph is an object itself. It has its own life. Um, so with this work, I picked... Uh, cyanotype because of its UV reactivity um, and I think before I talk about why I picked cyanotype I should talk a little bit more about the piece mm -hmm. um, so obviously like we talked about earlier being from Tucson you have these amazing you know vast open skies that the southwest gives you uh, and when I moved to Rochester New York you didn't really have that and so you have this totally different landscape so I remember everyone telling me oh you're gonna have such a shock like this is gonna be so different for you um, in my first semester there I had a teacher we were in the basement and we had our projector on, um, but it had that no signal kind of blue screen. And I remember her saying, ah, sometimes in the winter, I'll leave this blue screen on. And we just pretend <laughs> that's the sky. <laughs> and so that kind of shocked me. And it made me think like, oh, I could do that. And so I thought to myself, well, how could I make my own sky for the days that we don't have any? Yeah. So um, I thought, okay, well, cyanotype uh, needs sunlight to develop. That's, that's kind of the main ingredient to have, have it work. So I thought, what if I took all these pictures of, of clouds and skies? I've been obsessed with, with clouds since I was a little kid. So I thought, what if I just, you know, frenetically photograph any cloud that I see on any sunny day in Rochester? And that's kind of how this started. This is number two of, of them. Um, so I'd photograph them. I'd make make digital negatives in my in my room. And then I'd go in front of my apartment and, you know, slap as many in a print frame as I could, set them in the sun, and I would sit in the sun with them. 
So that was kind of my time to think about while the photograph's coming alive because the sun is literally giving it life, giving it its Im image, that's what I'm doing as well. I'm getting oh, vitamin D. I'm spending yeah. time enjoying the world around me. And that was kind of a really important thing. So not so much just making it or not so much having it was also the time making it is just as important for my own artistic process as um, the thing itself. So that's why I picked cyanotype on that one. So when I look at this, and I, and I have the great privilege, I get to see this every day, uh, multiple times a day. I feel like I'm actually on a spacewalk and I'm looking down <laughs> onto Earth, right? Because I, I know this yeah. is sky for you. Yeah. You know, but it feels to me like I'm looking down on, mm. onto Earth with the clouds that cover it. So yeah. I feel this sense of uh, almost weightlessness when, yeah. I, when I'm looking down. So I have a, maybe a different perspective yeah. from being up yeah. higher looking at it, but I sure get that. I don't have blue sky, so I'm going to make some. Yeah, yeah. And and the, the title of a halcyon, the definition is the denotation of a time period that was idyllically peaceful or calm. And so for me, it makes me think of being a kid and kind of looking at the sky and thinking, oh, that one looks like Pac-Man and that one looks oh, like yeah. a dinosaur. So when you look at this, you know, there's different clouds, different things. You know, I like this idea of childhood imagination and, and spending time out and, you know, being creative outside. Perfect. Um, so can I ask a question? Sure. So what made you decide to d to do this gradation thing, except for an aesthetic, you know, going into the depths of the... the uh, well, of the sky does kind of gradiate depending on the time of day as you yeah. watch. As you watch the cyan in the sky change, you know, you have different hues from the ground up. So I just wanted to kind of pick make one it, and, yeah. and make a gradient. Um, and I like this way. I just made it feel... I like the idea that it was light on top and heavier mm -hmm. at the bottom. And can I just point out that Every single one is is obviously you know different different kinds of clouds. Yeah. And then there's one right in the center with no clouds. That's just the moon yeah. straight behind um, the the one oh, that's very right yeah, there, yeah. There's a little tiny moon in there. Oh, it's yeah. Like, it's like his little secret. Right, yeah. You got to look very closely to see the moon. <laughs> and you can get absorbed into each of these yeah. images mm -hmm. individually, yeah. all on their own. Um, and these and are all hand cut. So yeah, and hand stuck torn, together, hand yeah. stuck. Yeah, hundred or yeah. over. 1,300 pieces of linen tape, 1,300, right? 7, 800 pieces of thread, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I like this idea that when you walk up to it, you know, you kind of activate it. Yeah. You know, just like the environment, you know, it it's there, but are you paying attention to it until you're kind of walking up to it? So it breathes life into the photograph. And, you know, they talk about with cyanotype that it'll fade over time, but um, if you put it back, if it's in light, it'll fade over time. But if you put it in a dark box, it'll kind of come back to life that cyan needs its beauty sleep. So just playing again on this idea that, you know, it has its own life and it does its mm -hmm. own thing and it comes alive when you bring it to life. Yeah, it's a, back to the object. Uh, each of these hand created and then put together in this installation. It's worth coming to the gallery to see that again. The virtual tour will, tour will take you through that. Um, you also made gum prints. I did. Okay. Uh, we just did a gum workshop uh, in here. Um, for me, gum was that process that I hated <laughs> and then I loved. Yeah. And there's a feeling and a sense about a gum print that's hard to describe. It, it can't be done digitally. There's no way to really truly emulate the, the sense of the depth of, of a gum print. So tell us about these. What, what was your attraction? Yeah, so same thing with me for gum. It was kind of that process that I learned. I was like, this is really frustrating, but I love how, how open it is. You can really do anything with it. You can add your own pigment. I like that you can kind of control the pigment in it, what types of medium you want to use for the pigment. For my black pigment, I usually use graphite or charcoal. I like this idea that it kind of references um, energy and, and the environment around us. You know, you can look at, say, that image on the, the bottom left right there, black and yellow. You can look at that and, you know, think the tree is a, a source of energy for us to consume and use, or it's, you know, it has been affected by our own consumption of energy using um, charcoal and graphite. So I like that idea with it. I like the idea that, you know, you can make so many different gum prints and each one is going to be unique. Oh, yeah. Um, one of a kind things, you know, add different layers, play with them. Um, with these, I like this idea that it's one night. I call it one night in many days because again, gum like cyanotype needs UV light in order to expose. And I like this idea that I'm making gum prints with UV light, sunlight of the night sky, that these two things wouldn't exist without the other, just like we wouldn't really have um, a separation between day and night if the other one didn't exist. So one has to have the other in order for it to exist. One of the things about uh, the gallery as you come through and you look at these various uh, installation techniques is that 
Brett really wanted to emphasize the object quality of these. So they aren't formalized by a mat, they aren't formalized by a frame. They are literally a, a representation and the physicality of it is so present when you, when you look at this work. Be putting a piece of glass in front of a gum print <laughs> really destroys one of the best attributes or aesthetics of, of gum printing. So uh, I'm glad that you left these semi-curled, deckled, edged, mm -hmm. and, and then you have this, this physicality experience with it also. Yeah, yeah I like that it's, it's the evidence of the artist's hand that, you know, I made it and I left it, I made the decisions to leave it how, how it is and how it is. Evan, exists. do we have a close-up? Uh, there we go. Yeah. yeah. So here you can see the deckled edges all the way around, and if you could see it in person, not on a flat computer screen, you'll find the, the three-dimensionality of these multiple layers uh, and the, the materials. So you say you use charcoal on this one? I do, yeah. So for the black, I, I like to use the charcoal. I like It gives it almost this drawing quality, which again references the use of gum printing in the 20th century for pictorialism. Mm -hmm. um, and I just like how kind of they become less photographic and I you know for me there's nothing more beautiful in a gum print than the brush strokes that's the image is almost like I just love I love that those subtle brush strokes um well and also compared and there's star trails in there too mm -hmm. I mean that's the yep. combination of yep. having brush stroke marks and then marks made by stars yep. yeah yeah the whole gamut right between the orotones and the gum prints and cyanotypes the artist's DNA is attached to every one of these images and when you know the artist has actually touched it, it's, it's, a, it's a great sense of their involvement in the creation of, of the work. Um, it might be that we're on time. Wow. wow. I'm, okay. I'm stunned. <laughs> but as we get into wrap up, we could press that just a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, we've got uh, this opening coming up uh, on June 5th. I hope everybody that's in town and, and in reasonable travel distance will, will join us. Um, tell me a little bit about what the last year and couple months of pandemic have meant for creativity, for working on this work, and, and kind of gathering your thoughts about how you would, would present this body of work. Um, I guess the pandemic actually in some ways, I mean, the one good thing about it is that, you know, it, it, by sort of having to not be a social person anymore, you, you get more done. <laughs> and um, because I work alone in my studio anyway as an artist, it hasn't made a whole lot of difference. I, I, mm. I still do that. And, uh, you know, we were inside each other's bubble in the sense that I knew he was careful and he knew I was careful and we could still get together a lot to go through exactly what we were going to do. And, of course, we were setting up the astronomy stuff. Well, yeah, we were stuck at home, so we thought, what can we do, you know, still making photographs, still making art? And, and yeah. Kate showed me these telescopes, and I was like, let's do it. Like, yeah, yeah that sounds fun. So We've the perfect pandemic path, yeah. In a way, yeah. In a way, yeah. Path, yeah. And then, you know, lots of, like, all the little clouds, I mean, they're sort of about that sort of isolation. You're just floating floating along, yeah. you know, in the, in the universe, in the, in the world, in the sky as an individual little creature and I don't know there's just lots of metaphors to be had about most of my oops sorry go ahead most of my images of, of the night sky is, is me out in the middle of you know pine top Arizona either by myself or with my dad you know kind of out in the middle just still isolated things still yeah. isolated and these are all older but I mean it's still that same thing of you know when I make art I like to like you dive into it not be mm. surrounded with people um, also I mean all, all of it, it just gives you perspective I mean you know the moon doesn't care the moon's seen the history of mankind mm -hmm. and you name it and and this is just another little tiny yeah. you know blip uh, yeah. as horrible as it is to say uh in in the history of the of it the is Earth. a blip yeah and um and once you start gazing at distant objects or even a close object like the moon and realizing you know you've got to get yeah. this incredible perspective on your own life and mm -hmm. and death and i thought during this pandemic of the isolation that people feel in different environments and I'd hate to be on a fourth floor walk up exactly. in New York City, yeah. mm -hmm. 600 square foot apartment. I think that would have made me crazy. <laughs> and, and they should have been surrounded by this work just so yeah. that they can feel yeah. that expanse when it actually is closed in walls. And I've always said, how lucky am I to have like the desert landscape yeah. and you know this beautiful uh, horizon and the endless space to contemplate during the time of great sorrow and suffering and so forth, because again, it makes you feel lucky compared to a lot of people. Yeah, I think that this illustrates that energy and, and positivity about mm. about the world, even in this time, which 
doesn't feel like a blip, but it, yeah. it, it will look that way in five years. Yeah. Um, next step, is there some place that you are going to go? Is there a book coming out about this? Uh, uh, you're going to be on the Tonight Show. Hopefully, uh, yeah. And this interview was setting us up doing? for the Tonight Show. It is. Right? This That's, is. Yeah, we're we're leading in with that. Yeah. We actually talked about doing some kind of little handmade book, especially of our space pictures, and we haven't finished with that yet. In fact, we're we were waiting for one. We're hoping to, to get the one. File scheduled one to come in, and so we could like go. Oh wow, our our, <laughs> our remnants of uh, supernova. <laughs> it's here. Yeah. <laughs> because that's what it's like. You know, they they're coming in, and we're still booking them, and we're still finding objects we want, and yeah. we'd like to put them in some kind of beautiful accordion book or something again. Something An accordion like book would be amazing. Yeah. I know. Yeah. 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 So that we'll do that. We'll definitely do that. So you can sense, I think, from the imagery you've seen in the pictures on the screen, uh, maybe through that virtual walkthrough, uh, the energy, I don't think this is going to go away. I think the passion will continue to exist in both of you and we'll probably see more of this work. Yeah. Evan, do we have any questions we need to address? We're in good shape. Good shape. All right. Okay. Uh, this will be available uh, in perpetuity on Facebook, as long as I don't get banned from Facebook, or <laughs> Brett gets banned, or Kate. I think we're in good good condition here. Uh, so you can watch this again. Absolutely, feel free to share it. Um, feel free to uh, in in any way comment on that. And if you have questions uh, after the fact, uh, feel free to drop an email to Art Intersection or to Kate or to Brett and. We'll be more happy to step up and answer questions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think we'll wrap then, yeah, guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for coming. Amazing. We're on time. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> you all have a good day.